I think it would be meaningful if you could share your involvement in the creation and launching of the Connecticut Women Lawyers Oral History Project. Actually, when I, I, I uh, was first assigned to Hartford uh, in 1998, I uh, realized, looking around the courthouse, that there were a lot of women in that courthouse who um, were among the very first women um, to be judges in the state of Connecticut. At a time when we still had available to us all these women, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could preserve uh, those stories? Where'd you go to law school? University of Virginia. What year would you have started at 60, Virginia? 61. Um, how many students were in your class total? There were 250, there were two women, and two blacks. How about professors? Were there any female professors in the three years that no. you were? What did your family think about your decision to go to law school? My parents thought it was fine. Um, they were like everybody else. What are you going to do with that? And how many women were there when you got there? Well, there was one other woman in my class, and that was considered a lot. The next clerkship with Justice Byron White. Yes, uh, how did that come about? That was serendipity again. Being a woman, again, probably helped. Um, so I applied to uh, four of the justices on the Supreme Court. I got an interview with two of them. One of them was Justice White. And when I came in for my interview, he said, I didn't want to cancel our interview because I wanted to meet you, but I have to tell you, I've already filled my woman's spot. So we had this nice interview anyway, and um, I just was looking around for things to do. I applied to be an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington. A call came in from Judge McGowan's office telling me that Justice White was trying to reach me and I should call him. Um, so I called and he asked me if I was still interested in the spot. So I went up and met with him again and had a great year clerking for him. For a student of color in the UConn Law School, uh, were there any faculty members who took time to mentor you? That, that was a little more difficult um, mm -hmm. to talk about mentoring. There really wasn't that kind of mentoring. How did you do in law school? Well, I was very fortunate. The move from Columbia to Connecticut UConn Law School was very fortunate on my part and I graduated number one in my class which meant that I was an acceptable candidate in many of the larger law firms uh, for becoming their token woman. One of the interviews that I had at the large law firm noted from either something I had said or my resume that I had a child and he asked me Oh, what are your plans for daycare? And I said, that's such an interesting question. Do you ask that to the men you interview? When did you go to Washington? After, right after law school, 1952. Did you do a job search to see what you might be able to find in, Was in Washington? I knew I didn't want to work for a law firm, but I decided I wanted to have one interview, so I picked the stuffiest law firm that was doing interviews and I remember the interview and the man said to me, he said, of course, I have to tell you that the members of my firm really don't approve of having women because either they're very attractive and then they leave to get married soon or they're so unattractive that they wouldn't want to have them around. I didn't feel any um, any discrimination at the firm, except when they were interviewing me for the, the permanent job, the senior partner did ask me whether my husband agreed that I should work as an attorney. The one argument that stands out in my mind is the one, I think it might have been the first one I made in front of um, the Supreme, Connecticut Supreme Court. I got up and I started making my argument and um, one of the justices, one of the male justices, stopped me and said, um, Attorney Davis, I have a question. Are those new glasses? I said, yes, yes, they are new glasses that I'm wearing, yes. 
They're very nice. You may continue. Needless to say, that kind of threw, threw off my, my momentum. I was at Hartford National Bank and Trust Company, which had used um, a private law firm pretty much as its general counsel. When I finished law school, at that time, the bank had decided to form its own legal department and asked me to stay on board to be a part of that, which was an exciting on-the-ground opportunity. So I was part of the law department before there was a general counsel to the law department. So what did you do out of law school? I represented a group of people who sued to take away Maury's liquor license um, on the basis of its discriminatory policies. There were strong advocates for keeping male clubs as an institution. So we had Yale, uh, you know, witnesses who would testify about the fact that uh, the important um, decisions at Yale, the corporation met at Morey's. Hiring entities came to Morey's to do interviews. Um, it, it, it was denying access to a significant population. So figuring out how to introduce the evidence was just very important and challenging. And the Liquor Commission did rule in our favor and took away Morey's liquor license. It was appealed to the Connecticut Supreme Court. They upheld the ultimate verdict. Why did you uh, choose to work in legal services? The idea that I was going to have a job that was going to assist with people who um, were, the, were underprivileged, were impoverished, whose rights were more often trampled on, who suffered from more ills um, than anybody else, where you could be fighting for particular uh, rights regarding education and housing and um, w was important to me. I tried the first um, continuing criminal enterprise case, which was a marijuana importing operation. I was in the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force until 1986, and then I was named to be the head of the office in Bridgeport. And at that point, I started doing um, international money laundering cases and some um, illegal export cases. And when the hiring freeze um, was lifted, I became an assistant U.S. attorney in New York. Giuliani came in as U.S. attorney, brought with him 100 FBI agents because he'd been at Maine Justice as associate attorney general. He had that kind of power. And he said, we're going after the mafia. Um, and he recruited me for that effort. And that's where I spent the rest of my time. The first time I went through the um, Judicial Selection Commission, I did not get through. Um, it was a very troubling um, interview. There are 12 people around a table who are asking you questions. One gentleman in particular monopolized the conversation and the gist of the conversation was, how do you think you can possibly be a judge and have two kids uh, and be able to do both jobs well? And I can't say that I handled that discussion perfectly, but I can tell you I was ready the second time around <laughs> that I, w I went through judicial selection about a year later, um, and it went much more smoothly. After 10 years, I had sufficient confidence um, to start my own practice. I wanted to be more independent and autonomous, and I felt very comfortable at that point um, starting my own solo practice. And so basically, you were able to practice in a variety of areas. I focused on predominantly family law. I continued to do a little bit of plaintiff's personal injury, um, some residential real estate, and simple wills. How could I ever have imagined when I was in law school looking for things that would interest me that I would be negotiating and working on the terms under which Yale University would return to Peru archaeological material that had been excavated by Hiram Bingham a hundred years earlier when he made the scientific discovery of Machu Picchu. I don't think I read a book for probably 15 or 20 years while my kids were growing up and I was trying to try cases and be a lawyer and on the managing committee and those sorts of things. Um, certain things just become unimportant. I was balancing work, marriage, and community activities. And so, again, as soon as I finished the studying and 
finish the bar exam and so forth, I felt a need to get right out in the community and see how I could remain a contributor and how I could become fully engaged. Being a mother and a lawyer as, and a judge, it's, it's not easy. It's just uh, another added um, you know, job that you have to do. Did you have to um, um, back off on the amount of work you were doing or, or uh, were you able to carry a full load while you were bringing these children up? Oh, ab absolutely, full load, no you can't. You, no one gives you a, a pass because you're a mother. What do you feel are the major differences uh, between your work on the trial court and um, as a member of the appellate court? The biggest difference is that when you're on the trial bench writing a decision, it's just you you have to convince. When you sit on a uh, case in the appellate court and write a decision, you've got to get two other people at least to go along with you. That's a collaborative process versus um, the trial bench, um, and it's, it's very challenging. By making thoughtful uh, and careful decisions, you can affect people's lives in a positive way. That is what um, I hope I have been able to accomplish as a judge. I did mostly, presided over mostly murder cases, sexual assaults, armed robberies. So how did you make it to the appellate court? There I was appointed by Governor uh, Daniel Malloy. Did you have any desire to leave the trial bench? Not really. I really enjoyed the trial bench. Um, but I, it was something I couldn't say no to, you know, to go on the appellate court. So it was, it was important to the Puerto Rican Hispanic community. What is your best memory as a judge? What was your, what's your favorite part? of the experience? My favorite part, I think, is trying cases and being in the courtroom and trying to balance people's viewpoints and claims and thinking about what is the appropriate outcome um, legally and what is the impact on the parties involved. I think that's the part that attracted me to begin with and continues to interest me. Do you think being a woman affects uh, your role as a judge? A lot of people have asked me that question and I'm not sure I have a good answer, but I'll give it a try. As a lawyer, I used to bristle when people would say I was a woman lawyer. And I would say, no, I'm a lawyer who is a woman. And I think I feel the same way about being a judge. I'm a judge who is a woman, just like Judge Underhill is a judge who's a man. What do you feel was the biggest um, change or changes in the practice of law uh, during your tenure as a judge? The one thing I don't think has changed, gender bias from our peers, not the obvious stuff, you know, where the judges are saying hi little lady from the bench, but the stuff that happens inside our, our um, lateral relationships, um, in firms, in the branch, um, uh, hasn't changed all that much. Have you been um, confronted with um, a conflict between the law and your conscience? The death penalty case, which we had uh, two years ago, uh, was, as you can imagine, as difficult a case as you're going to have. The difficulty for me was in deciding that I felt that the statute <coughs> abolishing um, the death penalty prospectively. I felt it was constitutional, but on both a moral and a public policy uh, uh, perspective, I'm anti-death penalty. And so that was when the rubber really hit the road because I needed to write something that I thought was correct under the law, but went against everything that, uh, that I believed in. And uh, I struggled with that. When Walter Flanagan, the former Danbury State's attorney, interviewed me, he said, trial law is like football. Women can play tennis, but trial law is like football. And I said, well, I've always wanted to be a quarterback. I interviewed with a number of firms uh, and with varying reception. There were no women um, partners or really even associates in any of the major law firms. I recall one older gentleman from a smaller law firm in Greenwich that did primarily real estate work 
and I couldn't believe it, but one of the primary questions he had for me is, wouldn't I have a problem? I kid you not, this was a question I was asked, wouldn't I have a problem lifting those heavy land record books? I was the first woman director of legal services uh, in Connecticut. I loved Judge Dorsey. Um, he had a pretty gruff exterior, but he was a really sweet, gentle, kind human being. When I first started my job, he goes, I'm really surprised that you're doing a great job. Um, I wasn't sure that a woman could do it, but you've proved me wrong. So I didn't know whether to hug him or slap him. <laughs> Most of the time that I was in court, unless I was in court with Judge Burns, I was the only woman in the courtroom. What was your involvement in the abortion rights case? In working on the legal arguments in the case, it became clear to me early on that the, the legal battle was about at what point did the state's interest become sufficient to impose restrictions on abortion. And that got presented in our case, in our briefing, and ultimately became the trimester uh, formulation that the U.S. Supreme Court adopted in Roe against Wade. Going back to your role as the chief court administrator, what were the uh, most significant challenges? The challenge for me personally was figuring out how best to work with uh, the legislature and to see if the legislative interests and the statutory changes they wish to make as well as the advocates could be balanced with what the judicial branch could actually do. And so that was the trick, to figure out how to balance everyone's interests. We have always kept a pro bono section to our practice uh, because that's what you feel good about, you know, that you help somebody who otherwise could not have prevailed against the system mm -hmm. to prevail. And, and, and that feels, feels very good. So I became very active with the New Haven County Bar Association and the Connecticut Bar Association. And I think that my doing that made legal services lawyers become more a part of the legal community. They, they looked at us differently. And after uh, being president of the CBA, did you continue to be involved in the Bar Association? Because as a result of being president of the CBA, I was so involved in the New England Bar Association, I later um, became president of the New England Bar. At Eastern, I thought the equity work was important to how we mentor students, by how we spend time with students, by how we um, confront discrimination in quiet ways. In terms of your experience before the Supreme Court, did anybody on that court have more experience no. appearing before the court or arguing before the court than you did? No one did. I mean, I had, um, I had argued, and I think even to this day, uh, no lawyer, no sitting justice had more appellate experience than I did. So you served almost two decades. 18 plus years. I probably wrote somewhere between 400 and 450 cases, and some of them... Well, um, you, you, that you wrote the opinion. Personally, that's right. I sat on over 2,000. Being a prosecutor meet the expectations you had? It far exceeded my expectations. I reached the pinnacle of my career, and it was the best career I ever could have hoped for. I would not have expected to like the law so much. I wouldn't have expected to be a criminal lawyer, and to find out that you could do so much good for so many people in that position, as well as on the bench, um, was a real revelation. I feel very privileged to be part of a profession that I think is immensely important and re immensely rewarding. It's not the financial end of the practice that, that really is ultimately satisfying. It's the fact that you felt you've helped people in the community achieve what was important to them.